Thank you for your patience. Now the concurrent session three, innovative use of renewables shall commence. First, I would like to introduce three moderators for the session. Professor Dr. Neboisha Nakchenovich, Professor Dr. Kenji Yamaji, and Professor Dr. Reiko Kuroda. Professor Dr. Neboisha Nakchenovich is ISF Steering Committee, Vice Chair of the Group of Chief Scientific Advisors to the European Commission, Honorary and Meritus Scholar of International Institute for Applied System Analysis, Emeritus Professor of Energy Economics, Vienna University of Technology. Professor Dr. Kenji Yamaji is ISAF Steering Committee, President for Research Institute of Innovative Technology for the Earth, Professor Emeritus for the University of Tokyo. Professor Dr. Reiko Kuroda is ISAF Steering Committee, Designated Professor of Frontier Research Institute, Chuba University. Professor Emeritus for the University of Tokyo, member of G7 Gender Equality Advisory Council 2023. Now I would like to ask Professor Neboisha Nakchenovich to moderate the session. Professor Dr. Nakchenovich, if you please. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, warm welcome to the, our concurrent session number three on innovative use of renewables. Um, I would just like to stress that I really like the title. The emphasis on use, I think, is really important because we need to think in systemic way about the role of renewables. So not just the supply, but also how the energy, renewable energy is converted and how it's end used. And it's probably so that end use itself transformations will be very important. Um, allow me, please, just to make a uh, few remark, introductory remarks before we go to our uh, esteemed panel members. Um, I, I would say that uh, since this is the 10th anniversary uh, ISEF forum, it's also good to reflect on the previous nine ones. And in all of those, I would argue that renewable energy innovation was, I think, a good story, uh, a good news story, um, and it continues to be. Uh, first of all, the cost of, cost of renewables has gone down orders of magnitude because of a very large deployment, explosion in deployment. We are already in the terawatt range, and through the learning processes, costs have gone down. And so I think on the way toward net zero, clear re renewables and their use are going to play a very crucial role. But I mean, if you think about the, the current situation in the world where we are facing multiple crises, I would say also the deep energy crisis. Uh, some people call that three C's, COVID, conflict, and climate. And perhaps the climate is the biggest challenge. And again, back to the renewables. So my expectation for this panel is that uh, we will have really a very comprehensive review of the renewable innovation including the end use, and then we would like to go to the discussion with all of you here in auditorium. So the structure of the, of the session will be, we go to the, our five panelists first, eminent panelists, then we'll give the floor to our co-chairs, co-moderators, to comment and provide reflections on what they have heard, um, perhaps also ask questions of our esteemed panelists, and, um, and then the panelists will have a chance to respond to that. And then what would we really like to do is go to all of you here in auditorium and also those online uh, to pose questions. So please think about, it would be nice if the questions were relatively short so that we can take quite a lot of intervention for a lively discussion. So that's basically the plan and then we'll conclude the session. So I hope that this next hour will be informative and enjoyable for all of us. So let us go straight to our panelists. Now, two of our colleagues, we have five esteemed eminent panelists, but two are online, they're not here. I, I, I hope that you will be able to see them on the screens first. So we will go to uh, our colleague, Doug Arendt, uh, who, will, who will be on online. He has a pre-recorded message, but he'll be with us during the whole session. Uh, Doug is from the national, he is the executive director of the Strategic Public Private Partnerships at the NREL, the National 
renewable laboratory in the US and we have the recorded message, but as I said, he's online. So please, if you can show Doug's contribution to the panel. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to join this panel. I'm very pleased to do so, and apologies that it is uh, virtual only. I will, in a very brief few minutes, cover three key areas uh, as myself and the nearly 4,000 research colleagues at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory have evaluated and continue to evaluate the prospects and potential for renewable energy technologies. In doing that, we'll cover very briefly policy, uh, kind of state of the art of technologies needed for high renewable penetration technologies, and then increasingly the need for new partnerships as we work with communities and countries around the world. First, I'd like to show you the results of recently published analysis of the bipartisan infrastructure law in the United States, which we have analyzed uh, the impacts on of uh, out to 2030, and you can see the key results here. Uh, on the left, uh, you'll see uh, the overall clean electricity contributions uh, representing uh, between 66 and 89 percent of total electricity provision, that is percent of generation by 2030, and this of course comes uh, from the increased contributions of predominantly solar and wind and decreased contributions of unabated fossil fuel, which you can see on the right-hand graphs. So a fair amount of detail behind this, uh, which is shown in the publication at the bottom of the graph, but uh, I think the key summary is, is that the laws as they have been passed provide uh, significant incentives for the acceleration of these clean energy technologies Assuming that the supply chains build out and are able to support the increased uh, generation uh, build out as well as transmission access, uh, et cetera, that's needed for that. Further, I was asked to reflect on what is needed in terms of technology innovation as we collectively and individually ramp toward much higher penetrations of renewable energy technologies, particularly in the power system and overall when power systems need to grow somewhere between three and 11 times by 2050, according to the IEA, in order to support electrified mobility uh, and uh, power to X technologies, including uh, hydrogen, clean ammonia, et cetera. So here you see a graph and a, an outline that uh, colleagues and myself have evolved over the last a decade or so showing the types of various interventions and the relative costs uh, of those uh, as one uh, thinks about a portfolio of approaches to integrating variable renewables and of course uh, a, a whole listing of solutions on the right hand side. Uh, what we can see here is that uh, there is a whole suite of options, uh, including operations, deriving services from the variable renewable energy technologies, including advanced generation control, auto generation control, now increasingly black start capabilities and voltage ride through and a bunch of other advanced uh, power uh, system services that are required. And then on the right-hand side, you see uh, extension of uh, flexibility uh, from other resources on the grid, uh, including transmission expansion, which we have published on for many decades, and then increasingly, of course, interest in and economic viability of storage itself. Last key point I would like to make, uh, just uh, using this uh, picture as a background, is that Cities like this, and frankly, one can expand this out to uh, regions or countries or interconnections among countries, is that these are very complex interconnected systems of systems. And they now 
rely upon an interconnection between mobility, chemicals, fuels, power systems, buildings, and industry. And this requires us to both think about how we innovate differently, how we implement differently, and it does demands a new approach uh, to do this through partnerships and dialogues that we have not uh, heretofore uh, really seen as critical to this integrated uh, low-carbon energy system future. So thank you very much. I realize that was quite short. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Doug. Uh, I, I really like the focus on the, on the integration and complexity of the energy systems, and hopefully that will also lead to some of the synergies. So let us go straight to our second panelist. Um, it's Niki Shiguru, who is the Director General of Sustainable Energy Unit of Technology Strategy Center at NEDO. So the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Naksan, for kind introduction. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank to the organizers for giving me a chance to present in this uh, important conference. So today I'm talking about towards sustainable deployment of renewable energy of carbon neutrality. My name is Shiru Niki from NATO. So renewable energy is one of the best uh, effective technologies to reduce CO2 emission. And the PV and the wind have a large potential to reduce CO2 uh, emissions and expected to play central roles in the future of global energy. So starting from PV, the PV reached a big milestone of one terawatt in 2022, entering the terawatt era, and the PV became the cheapest form of electricity in some regions worldwide. So I'm showing new applications here. New applications such as the sidewall of the buildings, on water, in farmland, and on mobility can accelerate the uh, penetration of PV systems further. And these applications need additional spe specifications such as very high efficiency over 30% and lightweight flexible high quality design and long term uh, stability under special uh, environment. Let me introduce a new technology, perovskite solar cells. The R&D of perovskite solar cells started in 2009 and the efficiency increased rapidly up to 26.1%. And module technology, long term stability and the replacement of lead are the most important tasks for the commercialization. I'm showing an overview of Green Innovation Fund project. And Japan is in the top group in the development of perovskite solar cells and aiming for market launch by 2030. The project will develop basic technologies as well as practical applications and demonstrations. And one more technology I want to introduce, at next generation tandem cells. And certain application needs high efficiencies beyond the theoretical limit of single junction solar cells. I'm showing the figure, the combination of two cells can cover the wide range of uh, uh, solar spectrum leading to high efficiencies. And currently, uh, no established top cell technology exists. So candidate is 3,5 compound perovskite and chalcogenize. And moving to the wind power, the IDENA estimated the expansion of wind power installation up to almost 5,000 gigawatt onshore and 1,000 gigawatt offshore in 2050. And wind power gains competitiveness as a main power supply and contributes significantly to the carbon neutrality by 2050, that the future goals. And five, uh, five key issues, cost competitive floating, further penetration of fixed bottom, 
and the repowering of onshore and the circular economy extended usage. These have to be established in order to make the wind power reliable and sustainable for a long time. And the offshore wind power has a lot of potential in Japan. And the floating type offshore wind is very important in Japan. And is still under development and competition worldwide. And the Green Innovation Fund project will develop the offshore wind power technologies suitable for weather and sea condition of Asia. And uh, I want to introduce several uh, like uh, R&D results and the erosion of wind turbine blades. Leading edge erosion takes place on the surface of a high speed rotating blades by hydrometer impact. And countermeasures including leading edge protection devices, inspection and maintenance methods, and new turbine control are under development. Another one is a severe lightning strikes. The lightning strikes is one of the major causes of wind turbine failure, and the countermeasures are especially important in Japan and the Southeast Asian countries. And robust uh, diverter strips, which are effective to lightning protection, have, to be, have been developed under NATO project. And I want to introduce one more emerging technology, hydrogen. Green hydrogen is one of the solutions, not only avoiding the grid uh, bottlenecks, but also decarbonizing industri industrial sectors by replacing the fossil fuel. And some projects have been demonstrated in Europe and also in Japan. And in summary, IEA scenario indicated 15 terawatt of PV and 8 terawatt of wind power deployment by 2050 and risks in material supply, and uh, mass disposal of equipment and facility from renewables uh, will become critical issues to be solved for further penetration of renewables. Sustainability throughout the full life cycle is very important topics for renewables. And we should aim for maximum energy with minimum resources. So this is the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for highlighting the huge potential of innovative technologies uh, of the renewables. I mean, terawatt scale is really very impressive in the, uh, by 2050, and also hydrogen might be a very important uh, source of future, uh, future energy carrier for the net zero economy. And then last but not least, the offshore wind, and I think that goes smoothly to our next presenter. Uh, who is Bjorn Simonsen. He is the CEO of Worldwide Wind. Uh, and um, I'm particularly excited to hear more about the new design of counter-rotating counter turbines. Bjorn, the floor is yours. Thank you. So the global wind potential offshore is massive, but it's in deep oceans. Uh, this. Uh, analysis made by uh, SMAP uh, slash the World Bank shows that the potential less than 200 kilometers offshore is 71,000 gigawatts. Well, what's 71,000 gigawatts? The total electricity generation capacity today, nuclear, coal, gas, sun, and wind is 10,000. So, so just 200 kilometers offshore, the all the pretty colors you see here, that is 71,000 uh, gigawatts. And uh, as we, we just heard from the previous speaker, solar just passed 1,000 gigawatts onshore, and the same applies for wind. So uh, to, to have a large uh, uh, exploitation of renewables, we need to go offshore. And I spent, before I joined uh, Worldwide Wind, I spent 15 years in the hydrogen sector, primarily working on green hydrogen. That has taken me to Japan many, many times. And uh, now I'm working on the uh, raw material side for, for green hydrogen, because obviously if we're gonna produce all that green hydrogen uh, and its derivatives in a, in a sensible manner, we need to have low cost renewable electricity. And I believe 
floating offshore wind will unlock that potential. And it kind of reminds me of the hydrogen industry 10 years ago. So the potential is massive, but we're just at the very, very early start. So, so this is the uh, um, predictions of uh, the global deployments annually of floating offshore wind going forward. And if you see for 2023, it's 103 megawatts, and 88 of those were on the high wind uh, project uh, of Equinor in Norway. So it's still at its very early beginning, but obviously this is going to grow significantly. There's just one big uh, problem. Today's wind turbine technology is just as well suited for floating on water as sailboats are for moving on land. The technology hasn't been developed for offshore um, applications. And while you could put wheels on the sailboat to move it around on land, it doesn't make it into a good vehicle. And the same way for the wind turbines to, to make them float, even though they're developed for standing on land, we need to build artificial floating islands for them. And we need to have specialized ships to install these wind turbines. The inherent design that we have from the horizontal axis wind turbines, well, that is okay for land, but once we move offshore, it complicates things a lot. And today there is more than 100 floater concepts out there uh, to uh, kind of replicate land to accommodate for offshore floating wind. And then you could ask the question, is the next uh, floater going to solve the issues we see for floating offshore wind? We don't believe so. We believe we need to think differently. So we've designed a wind turbine which has the characteristics of a sailboat with the heaviest part of the turbine, the generator, located in the bottom of the structure below the surface, leaving only the light wind catching elements above the surface, just like a sailboat. With the generator in the bottom, we're not constrained to make it as light as possible. So we can use ferrite magnets instead of neodymium and other rare earth metals. We can make it bigger, and we can also use local manufacturers of uh, synchronous uh, motor generators. Um, we also let the wind turbine lean with the wind, also like a sailboat, and that makes the entire structure up to 50% lighter and less costly than the conventional solutions out there today. Here you see a, a, a video of how this turbine will operate when it's out in the water. Not blue skies, well, we're a fan of good weather, but obviously when it's a, a stormy, that's when these turbines will uh, enjoy themselves the most. So if it's not blowing, this turbine would be standing upright, exactly like a sailboat. So, so this is the principle. We've patented the design uh, uh, and uh, we're launching the first 30 kilowatt prototype by the end of this year, moving on to a megawatt scale uh, pilot that we will test by the end of 2026. And then we have a target to launch a 24 megawatt uh, commercial scale turbine in the market before 2030. And the design of this also allows for a much uh, bigger expansion of the turbine than the conventional ones, because we don't need to lift something on top of the tower. We don't need those ships to install the turbine. The turbine, in a sense, installs itself or it gets itself upright, because we will pull all these uh, components out to the site or mount them in the water at the pier, and then we will let the turbine uh, uh, get up on its own. Uh, and it also ac accommodates uh, quite well for, for local manufacturing supply chains. I already mentioned the, the generator. We don't use a, a, a Siemens or a Vestas a generator. We can use a generator from, from a local supplier. It's quite a bit of reduced complexity also in our design. We don't have any 
uh, pitch on the blades. The blades are, are stuck in one position as a vertical axis turbine is. Uh, we also plan to use glue lamb, so uh, laminated glued wood for the mast and for the blades, uh, enforced with aluminium. Uh, and we'll have a concrete spar, which also can be manufactured locally. Uh, the deployment I already talked about, it's, it's uh, simple, and we believe also the logistics uh, is very well suited for, for local manufacturing. So some call what we do uh, floating winds Tesla moment. Uh, we call it the most logical way of harvesting wind offshore. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing this visionary innovation. Wish you lots of luck with the deployment and upscaling. Uh, I think that's going to be a challenge, and I think that you mentioned that there are 100 designs, if I remember correctly, also shows we are in a very early innovative phase. So there is a long way to go. And maybe just one tiny comment, yeah, the 70 terawatt potential within 300 kilometers, that's, you know, in the first approximation, seven times the total global energy today. And if you abstract from the thermal uses, it's even larger. So huge potential. Good luck with all of that. So let us go to the, our fourth panelist, Rebecca Brecknant. She's also online, but we have a pre-recorded message from her. I, I expect this to be a very interesting presentation because she's a co-founder and chief marketing officer of Pineberry, a Pineberry. That's a German-Kenyan service provider uh, and of service of everything, I think, is the slogan. I look very much forward to the, to the pre-recorded presentation. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. This is Rebecca from Pineberry, and I would like to present to you our Everything as a Service platform for scaling access to renewable energy. Starting with a short overview, Pineberry is a German Kenyan social business, and our mission is to scale access to clean energy with digitalization. We kicked off in 2018, and back then manufactured solar home systems, but then realized the vast potential and also need for digital solutions, which is why we then switched to developing a software platform for organizations in the energy access space. So what is the basic problem? There are still nearly 1 billion people in the world that are left in the dark at night using toxic and harmful kerosene. In the past years, a market evolved, which serves communities off the grid, so off the electricity grid, with standalone clean energy. For instance, let's take a solar home system, you put a panel on the rooftop, which charges a battery, and this battery then operates several appliances. That's the basic principle. The problem here is the energy access sector faces several challenges in order to reach these people off the grid. So according to several co-creation studies we conducted with over 50 participants, energy access providers need to ensure energy is affordable for consumers. They need to manage all the products and payments in the field and they need to reach economic viability in those challenging settings. And also, the energy access market is quite heterogeneous. We have different system sizes, various portfolios, different payment types, and also yeah, varying sales channels to reach those people off the grid. But these pressing challenges can be solved with digital solutions for energy access providers that are customizable in terms of features, roles, logo, and colors that offer inclusive pay-as-you-go financing options for consumers and also different payment types, from mobile money to cash, from rent-to-own versus leasing models. And also those solutions can be integrated with existing ecosystems and the IT landscape of clean energy providers. So important is that Every operating model is special and has special needs to operate most cost efficiently. And this is where Pineberry comes in. So Pineberry turns solar systems into jukeboxes, or actually into connected jukeboxes. So how does that work? 
The basic principle of the jukebox is you insert a coin, then the music is on for let's say 30 minutes, and then the music is automatically turned off and you need to insert another coin. So Pineberry transfers this concept to solar home systems. So basically consumers pay an installment, then the solar system is switched on for let's say one week, and then the solar system is switched off automatically again because of the connection to the cloud. So the systems become smart. So Pineberry has developed the first everything as a service platform that enables clean energy providers to manage their operations in one central platform, save costs and time while scaling their business and impact. So energy players can now manage all their customers and products in one central place, be sure their customers are paying thanks to the jukebox and keep full control over all connected products. One example of an operating model is uh, Last Mile as a service model where sales agents sell solar products in the field. Another model would be Minigrid as a service where solar electricity can be sold from a central point of electricity in the village. So Pineberry turns solar systems into jukeboxes, but actually it can be any product. So energy players can expand their business models. They can, for instance, rent cooling compartments using cooling as a service. They can sell water using water as a service or selling and renting e-vehicles or swapping batteries using the e-mobility as a service module. And at the end of the day, they can measure the impact created. So off-grid villages are transformed into fully connected villages and may look something like this in the end. So our vision as a team is to reach 200 million people until 2030, prove that sustainable business models work and contribute to various sustainable development goals. Thank you very much and let's connect. Thank you, Rebecca, if you can hear us online. And this was a wonderful presentation. I'm really happy that you addressed the biggest challenge that we have in the energy area, that is the, to provide access for almost a billion people who do not have access. And, and also the paradox that everybody in the world has a phone, but billion people don't, cannot, cannot charge at home. And I hope that this will be a new avenue of empowering everybody. So let us now go to our fifth, um, Last but certainly not least, panelist, uh, Sando Akihiro, who is a senior researcher at the Renewable Energy Institute in Japan. And uh, I believe that you will brief us a little bit on the activities about ge geothermal energy. Yes. Please, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning. This is Akihiro Sando uh, from Renewable Energy Institute. Uh, uh, today, uh, yeah, main, uh, renewables are mainly uh, solar and wind, but uh, please don't forget about uh, geothermal. So I will, today I will talk about geothermal, uh, what makes geothermal uh, proceed. Uh, I, am, uh, I am now, uh, my field is uh, on uh, local coexistence and local economics on the offshore wind and geothermal. And today, yeah, about geothermal. And uh, in the Renewable Energy Institute, we're working on the research and studies and also the policy recommendations on the all renewables. And I'm now working on the offshore wind and geothermal uh, to make uh, uh, the sustainable and rich society based on renewables. Uh, and also, uh, I have two hats. Uh, one is academic and two is a local activity. Uh, I have been working on the local activity in the Nagasaki called the Obama town. Uh, which is a hot spring area. Uh, I participated in the project uh, in uh, 2012, and uh, it was uh, not on, uh, it's a small-scale geothermal project, but uh, it's not a, uh, it, it is a community-led project. So it's not by the company, but uh, we, the, I, I was the resident there, and uh, 
as a resident, one of the residents, uh, we are working on the, this project uh, from 2013. So uh, today, yeah, I want to talk about geothermal, but uh, uh, compared to other uh, renewables, uh, geothermal is a kind of a not at all impressive. Uh, yes, uh, it's, uh, uh, the potential is uh, uh, smaller than uh, the solar and uh, uh, wind. But uh, yeah, uh, maybe as you know, the potential of geothermal is uh, uh, in Japan, uh, third thir uh, world's third largest, uh, 23 gigawatt, and, uh, and uh, that's an estimated resource in the world, uh, 190 gigawatt in total. And install, uh, it's in total, it's 16 gigawatt, only 16 gigawatt, uh, which, which is uh, less than 10% of potential. And as of Japan, uh, as you see, uh, it's very small that uh, the potential is third largest, but uh, the install is only uh, nine or 10th, 10th uh, ranked. And uh, geothermal, uh, we have uh, general issues in geothermal. Uh, one is development, development cost, high cost. Uh, two is the consensus building. Uh, three is the national park, uh, most uh, uh, resources in national park. And also the, the pr uh, processes, complicated processes. And uh, luckily, uh, in Japan, uh, the Japanese government is already working on these uh, obstacles. Uh, as of the cost, uh, we already have a good financial support. Uh, government led uh, the survey and development already. As of the consensus building, uh, we had uh, uh, the program to support the study, study group to the for the local people about the geothermal. And also the, the monitoring uh, is now in mandatory. As of the national park, uh, some of the, uh, uh, most of the national park area is now uh, deregulated. Uh, for the uh, geothermal development. Uh, there's uh, some conditions, uh, under some con conditions. And those other of the processes, uh, we have a, a environmental impact assessment, which is very important, but uh, uh, we can uh, do the uh, three or four uh, processes in one process, which shortens the uh, process in total. So uh, the Japanese government is still working on uh, uh, is working on these obstacles. But still, uh, in Japan, geothermal uh, power is not, uh, still low. Uh, why? Uh, this is my, uh, my thought. Uh, the root cause of geothermal in Japan is, uh, there are three uh, root causes. Uh, lack of predict predictability in the development process, uh, the guarantee and trust on local engagement, and uh, no rule and definition of on foods is uh, geothermal resources. And uh, as of the lack of predictability uh, in Japan, uh, we don't have uh, uh, to, to, to develop the geothermal energy. There's no uh, bidding process or the, it, it's free to uh, find the resource for now. So uh, for the local people, uh, the region, geothermal region people, uh, it's, there are so many uh, developers coming to see the, the, and the pos potential and possibility of the project. But for the local people, it's too many uh, companies coming, so it's, uh, now it's uh, local, those local regions, uh, uh, those geothermal regions are very in chaos. Uh, that uh, leads to the, some conflicts. As of the guarantee and trust on local engagement, uh, there's no concrete rule on the uh, local engagement. There are some uh, good example uh, to have a co coexisting the, with uh, developers and local people, but it's not a, uh, mandatory right now. That's two. And uh, number three, uh, I think this is the most important uh, thing, uh, the definition of the uh, geothermal resources. Now, uh, uh, geothermal, uh, as you know, uh, or you come into Japan, uh, there are a lot of good onsen, hot spring. Uh, yeah, I, I also like a hot spring, and I'm now living in uh, Obama town, which is a hot spring area, which is a good uh, place to live. Uh, but uh, as of geothermal energy, uh, since onsen is so strong in Japan, uh, geothermal is uh, a little bit weaker than the onsen uh, 
uh, the people uh, because of the, the law of onsen in Japan. Uh, the law of onsen is now uh, based on the, the hot spring, uh, which was made like a m many, many years ago. Uh, the, but uh, onsen is mainly using the shallow, uh, the resources from shallow area, shallow depth. Uh, but uh, because of that, there's no uh, geothermal law yet. So it's, the law is so complicated and uh, uh, the truth is uh, there's no boundary of geothermal resource holders. For example, uh, if you have a, a onsen uh, yourself, you, you hold the uh, onsen, and uh, you, maybe you can say uh, the geothermal resource underneath like uh, 100 meters or so, uh, but uh, in Japan, uh, the re uh, realistic, you can say the geothermal uh, resource, uh, which is uh, 10 kilometers from your uh, the, whole, uh, the onsen area, because there's no law which is uh, writing about the boundaries, wh which is a boundary and whose geothermal resource is. So that you can say it's your resource even as far as uh, 10 kilometers or five kilometers or 20 kilometers. So this ambiguous uh, and unclear situation causes conflict, conflicts. <laughs> And uh, so the, what uh, I'm proposing is uh, now, uh, as I said, I'm uh, also working on the offshore wind. And in Japan, uh, the centralized uh, system will be uh, acting soon, uh, which is about, uh, which is a uh, government-led development uh, and zoning and uh, uh, public bidding. So the geothermal should do that same thing uh, as a, uh, which is the same as uh, offshore wind, uh, concept, uh, which needs a con con uh, consensus building with the local fishermen. The second one is, is uh, basically- Akihiro, may I just ask you to come slowly to conclusion? Because okay. Okay. we are running out of time, apologies. Uh, got it, got it. <coughs> okay, uh, so basic rule on the local engagement to the geothermal, uh, which is about like a local fund or a local investment, we need rule. And also the clear definition of whose geothermal resource is, uh, so that uh, we, if we define the, uh, the, sh uh, the resource, easier to find the stakeholders and less confliction from misunderstanding. So the uh, no, innovations, mainly like a technology or sometimes market, but uh, we also need a policy, you know, innovation in policy too. So we need balance of the technology and business environment and the policy making. So now, uh, as of geothermal, lack of predictability and, and, uh, uh, and guarantee and trust and no rules, uh, if we uh, solve these problems, you can proceed the geothermal, uh, geothermal policy. So that, uh, this rule creates the situation, geothermal reach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we come to our co-moderators. And I think Kenji, if you want to take the floor. OK, thank you. And thank you for a very nice presentations. And I have prepared several comments and questions in advance, but uh, most, most of the pre prepared ones are covered by the presentation. I will pick up a few remaining points. One is the issue of grid integration of variable renewable energy. This area is mainly covered by Doug Arendt. But one issue, additional issue I'm thinking is the massive introduction of variable renewable energy causes a shortage of rotating inertia in power system. That makes unstable situation of unstable frequency in a transient case. So how to deal with uh, this uh, uh, rotating inertia shortage issue? So that is one. The second one is rather uh, general, because the uh, theme of our session is innovative use of renewables. But many panelists say touch upon innovative technologies of renewables. So how is the uh, innovative use of renewables. Good case is Rebecca Bregant. She shows us a quite nice off-grid use of solar at a 
jukebox or something. It's quite uh, interesting. But uh, there are several more uh, innovative use of renewables, such as non-electricity application. Hydrogen was touched upon, but the hydrogen can be used fuels and uh, material to making chemicals, and also heat. Uh, geothermal uh, heat application for onsen is already mentioned. There are several additional applications of heat. It is for all panelists. That is my comment and question. Thank you, Rico. You're next. All right, thank you, because we don't have really enough time. So I really share the same comments with your Maji Sensei, but you know, technological innovation is really advanced. But we need not only technological innovation, but innovation, maybe a policy, also social sciences, but the communities. And of course, to get the indigenous people's agreement and they want to use this renewable energy, we have to tell what is a good point, but what is the disadvantage as well. Only say this is good, this is good, it doesn't get the uh, agreement, uh, consensus with the local people. Yes, jukebox is quite nice, but I don't know how it is connected, how expensive. And what we wanted to find out is LCA, life cycle assessment, how long is the uh, lifetime? It can be usable, and when it's come to not efficient, how can we recycle these uh, very big systems? That sort of thing we have to consider. So I, I just... I think I don't have time, so I'll stop here and ask five panelists comments or reply. Thank you very much for the reflections on the, on the panel presentations. As usual, we are running out of time. Time is the most precious resource, so I would really like you to ask you to make very brief responses to the comments that you have heard from our co-moderators, and then we go to the audience. So maybe in the sequence, uh, as you're sitting there, and then we'll see if our colleagues online can join as well. Yeah, please, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for questions and the comments. And um, I think uh, we got a lot of uh, questions, so I don't know which one I should uh, answer. Um, but, uh, no, um, I think uh, Kurodo sensei mentioned about uh, recycling. And uh, recycling is very important because um, we need a mass uh, deployment of uh, PV and uh, also so, like uh, uh, wind power. Then uh, uh, we need a lot of material. So the supply of materials and also uh, um, the disposal of the, uh, you know, like a new renewables is a very uh, big issue. And for as far as you know, like uh, PB is concerned, the currently uh, we have a problem of uh, uh, copper, silver, and also indium and uh, high quality silicon for the recycling. And uh, I think a recycling project is going on in Japan and also in Europe, United States. But we have to improve the efficiency of recycling further. That is an uh, important thing. I think we have to focus on. And another question of, uh, um, maybe I will ask, no, answer one more question. And um, Yamasensei mentioned about inertia. And that I think that is a very important point. And uh, just uh, you know, in order to have a high penetration of renewables, I think we have to have a, you know, like a storage. And also, we have to consider how the inertia issue is solved. We may be able to use hydrogen and ammonia to support this. And also, we have a grid issues, like a digitalization of grid, and so on. So we have to work on various issues. Then that can make possible the high penetration of renewable. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Bjorn? Yeah, maybe I'll comment uh, on the uh, innovative use. and. and First and foremost, uh, we are here because we believe we can support the, the Japanese uh, uh, development of floating offshore wind, and I'm here to discuss both with, uh, with partners and developers uh, on that. Uh, with regards to innovative use, um, 
You know, if you have very, very cheap renewable energy, you can make anything. You convert it to hydrogen, you have carbon sources, CO2 from waste incineration, etc. So I think, uh, and that's why I'm working where I'm working to, to uh, push the price of renewables down. And I think we need to think differently about uh, renewables also, that renewable energy is not necessarily electrons moving through copper. And I think also for Japan and the energy situation here, uh, when we look at uh, expanding uh, the, the uh, use and implementation of renewables. So instead of thinking uh, offshore wind and copper wire is going to the shore, maybe we should look at uh, the most attractive offshore wind areas uh, and develop uh, hydrogen production that goes through a pipe uh, to the shore, not necessarily uh, through copper. So I think thinking differently about, about that uh, and uh, about the use of electrons. It's not just to light up uh, our, our lights anymore. It, it can be used for uh, a wide variety of uh, various applications and products in society. Thank you, Akihiro. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, about the innovative use. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, that innovative use means uh, the use well the unused resources. And uh, in global view, uh, solar and uh, wind is a very huge potential. But uh, in local view, uh, some regions don't have a good wind. Uh, some regions don't have a good enough uh, solar. So, but yeah, then if you have a geothermal uh, resource, you can use the electricity and also the heat use. So use it well, uh, which is an in innovative use. That's what I think. Thank you. Now let's go to our panelists who are online. Rebecca, can you hear us? Would you like to react? I can hear you. Can you hear me too? Yes, yes, very well. Okay, great. Yeah, first of all, uh, thanks very much for having me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, speak at this conference and also meet the other speakers and uh, moderators. So um, about the questions, maybe um, just very briefly, <laughs> since we're running out of time. So um, picking up the jukebox principle, basically it means um, yeah, uh, switching solar systems off and on. Um, and we make solar systems smart by either adding like a firmware library, so by software, which is completely remote, or by adding um, a PCB add-on, so adding a piece of hardware. And um, from a cost point of view, this can be very um, efficient. So basically, we collaborate with uh, local suppliers, with manufacturers uh, that serve those uh, rural areas in developing countries. And also, uh, in order to make it yeah, um, affordable even for smaller um, entrepreneurs, uh, but also SMEs and basically um, yeah, any organization size, um, we have established a subscription model. So basically, um, when our customers scale, uh, then we scale as well. This is uh, what it, how it works, basically. Um, yeah, because also, same with the uh, uh, population uh, that we want to um, yeah, provide energy, as much uh, renewable energy as possible to or reach as many people as possible. We also want to um, yeah, make sure that as many organizations as possible um, yeah, can, can make use of the software and basically scale their renewable energy um, yeah, devices. Thank you very much. Uh, Doug, I hope you can hear us. I, I understand that your connection is a little bit unstable. Yeah, this is one of the handicaps of the digital age. It doesn't always work. So anyway, I, I would suggest we go now to the questions from the audience. Uh, I, I, I hope you have also enjoyed the presentations, have learned a lot, and there must be some questions. Be Doug, are you back? No. no. Oh, he's using the phone. On the phone, yeah. Doug, can you hear us? But he's speaking, but his sound. Yeah. Oh, he can hear us. Do you want to briefly comment on the on the responses? Difficult, huh? Okay. Well, just let us know when when you have a connection, and we'll give you the floor. Let's do it that way. So let, let's go to the questions uh, from the floor. 
Are there any questions for our panelists? We, we do have one question from the internet. While you're thinking about what, what to ask, let me just try to read it. And um, uh, so the question is, how can we go beyond the installed existing business and politics? There is, okay. Yeah. Well, let me just read this question and we'll go to that. Uh, how can we go beyond the installed existing business and politics, politics, the practices and mindsets to overcome the earth problem threat, threatening the future of our children? So it's a general question, but I think a very good question, given that renewables might be the solution. So keep that in mind. Let's take the question from the floor now. I see there is one in the back. Uh, do we have a microphone? Yeah, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Ahmad Rajabi, Deputy uh, Embassy of Iran in Tokyo. Thank you very much for uh, <clears throat> all the uh, key speakers and uh, uh, for their informative, very informative information and uh, sharing their knowledge to us. Uh, first of all, uh, I have a comment and uh, I have a question and I will try to uh, answer please, your please question. Please, because we are running out of time, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is no doubt that all of us and all the country is interesting to move from the using the fossil fuel to renewable energy. And, but there is a reality that we should reality that it is, cannot be open in the short time and we should show our flexibility on all the countries, especially the developing countries. Uh, we, all of us, we have a commitment in the context of the Convention and Paris Agreement. And it seems that uh, some parties is not ready, is not ready to uh, implement their commitment in the framework of the Convention and the Paris Agreement. For example, we have a commitment of the uh, paying of $100 billion from uh, uh, Copenhagen COP. And after that also, we have a commitment uh, on the transfer of the technology and providing uh, financial resources for developing countries. Yeah. Could but, I please ask you to pose the question because we are really out of time. We have only another five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just let me my, conclude my uh, uh, remark. And the, 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 I mean that uh, all the focus on the mitigation, uh, whereas we have a mit adaptation and the means of implementation. So with this situation that uh, described by the panelists, how we can move from the using of the fossil fuel to using of the, uh, the, the renewable energy and clean energy. The uh, question is that uh, uh, if with this situation, it could be happen, they circulate just by between the few of the developed countries. And we should consider the, the, this prop, the, 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 the global uh, problem. It should be uh, go to the, uh, to the find the global solu uh, the solution. Oh. And it means that the, the cooperation between the all countries is needed. Thank and, you very much. And, I'm afraid and we let have me, to let stop me here. back to your question. Yeah. How we could save the children and how we could save the, yeah. our planet just with cooperation between the parties in the context of the uh, convention and the Paris Agreement. Without that, we cannot uh, resolve our problem and we need to cooperate with together. Thank you very much. So, my dear friends, colleagues, we are completely running out of time. We can have, you know, very brief 10 second comments and then we have to come to the end. Anybody? Really, very, very brief. Uh, thank you for the question. I think uh, the very good thing is the uh, uh, cost of uh, renewable energy is very low. And uh, some, in some areas, the PV and the wind power is the uh, uh, lowest cost you know, in the world, uh, comparing to other uh, electricity. 
So that is a very, I think, a make possible the deployment of these renewables to various countries. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Very brief, please. Yeah, I, I would just uh, uh, mirror that because if you look at the development over the last 10 years, with uh, solar dropping probably 80% and, and wind dropping 10%, that's 70%. Uh, I think that with that development in mind, looking forward, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about uh, the, the development. Well, all good, good. you also want to comment then briefly, please. Uh, uh, yeah. Motivation is very important. Uh, so imagine your future, imagine your town's future, imagine your families. Uh, cities, countries, uh, the global uh, view, that's very important, so in, uh, the, yes. These are actually very good concluding remarks as far as I'm concerned. Well, uh, I think all good things must come to the end. I mean, I think we had a great session, but the hour went very, very quickly. Fortunately, we uh, covered the full range of challenges and opportunities that, that um, innovative use of renewables poses for us. So. A good way forward. Thank you very much. I would like to thank our panelists. I would like to thank our co-moderators. I would like to thank you in the audience for asking the questions and the question from the internet. So thank you very much. This closes our session.